Thank you for your interest in the topic of my lecture, which uh, was for myself was was quite interesting and uh, fascinating. But after the invitation, I didn't feel like I could decline. Um, I always wanted to know a little more about the place and the city where I grew up and the museums um, that I remember uh, since I was a little boy and um, where I would spend time as a young man, as a student and later. We are going to talk about the Lviv collections until 1939. These are uh, different uh, types of collections by their origin. They are different by the purpose. They uh, vary a lot from what we are used to, um, uh, like state museums or national museums, with a well collected, well uh, staffed uh, personnel. And we don't even know how they came to be. In fact, they were born out of the collections which started in a different society, uh, under different circumstances. In the society where to have a collection, to be interested by art, was a privilege of very wealthy people, not only wealthy, but also noble people, uh, for whom the uh, art gallery, the portrait gallery, were a collection of family documents, not just family documents, the collection of arms or hunting trophies. It was a matter of honor, it was a standard these uh, noble people lived by. The, the, I'm talking about the nobility, and could you please switch off your telephone? Let's start with the Polish collections, because the majority of the collections... Could you please switch off your phone or uh, go out of the room? The nobility traditionally owned collections uh, in their uh, estates. And these estates were normally located outside the city because uh, the gentry uh, didn't live in the cities. They lived in castles, in the estates, and uh, this is where they would uh, collect uh, these items. However, as time went by, the people, uh, these people would uh, move to the cities, not only to the city of Lviv. Uh, you need to understand they were not city residents, they were the gentry. Uh, that's why they collected uh, their uh, collections where they served, uh, where uh, they served their military service or official service. Let me start with the oldest collection with the National Ossolinsky Institute with its library, museum, and archive, which was established in 1816. It was a collection by uh, Count Yusuf Maximilian Ossolinsky, who served as secretary at the Vienna court and collected archives, books, manuscripts, and museum items. Uh, and then uh, at the end of his life, he decided to give away uh, this collection to the people of Poland. And in this way, he created a people's institute, not in the meaning a national institute, because national has a few hints, um, a few uh, colors which we mentioned yesterday, but it was about 
the people that he wanted to donate it to. It was. It is difficult to talk about Poles as a unique uh, nation uh, at that time, simply because they survived a few partitions and were located either in Russia, in Prussia, or in Habsburg Empire. On the other hand, it was the time when the Poles were divided by gentry, by the city residents, by the peasants, and the gentry n and uh, not always viewed a Polish peasant, and especially a non-Polish peasant, as uh, 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 belonging to the same people. The gentry even had a myth of being of originating from a different uh, place than the peasants. The Ossolinsky Institute uh, was uh, this name was given to it uh, much later, but it was established based on the collection of Josef Maximilian Ossolinsky and uh, Henrik Lubomirsky. He was a different uh, nobleman who, in 1823 donated his collections to the same uh, institution in Lviv. The collection of Lubomirsky was uh, uh, at the beginning part of the Ossolinsky uh, Institute as an art museum. However, later, uh, at the Soviet times, the majority of the art collections was moved to the uh, art gallery and other museums, and altogether it combines a uh, Stefanik uh, uh, research library. I uh, would like to tell you a few words about the history of the building of the institute. It used to be a monastery, a Carmelite uh, nunnery. And at the time uh, of Emperor uh, Joseph II, most of the uh, Catholic orders were canceled. And uh, so the, the nunnery, the church, was uh, standing empty and thus transferred to the Ossolinsky to be ref transformed into a library. Then the Austrian uh, architect, Piero Nobile, uh, Italian by origin, uh, designed a library as we know it today. However, he never came to Lviv. He uh, designed it uh, for, for remotely. And then the local uh, engineers and architects, uh, uh, Bam and, and Salzburg, and Johann Salzburg, he is the same architect who made the Skarbek Theater, um, which is now called Maria Zenkovetska Theater, and other buildings in Lviv. They adapted the design to this building, and so we have now this classicist uh, building. A few more words about architecture. Everyone was building in this heavy uh, classicist style like the city council. And the Lviv residents didn't like the style um, at all. Um, in a while, it was called uh, a barrack style. Uh, but these were the years of reaction, the Metternich re reaction in the Has uh, in Habsburg Empire. However, as time went by, the uh, uh, Osolinam Institute's Karbek Theater uh, turned into uh, the city's legacy, and the city uh, got to love it. Uh, the same story goes with the Temple Synagogue, which was also built in the classicist style and was questioned by the residents. What did Osolina, uh, what was, was it made of? Uh, it was a library, and this is how the book depository looked. It had an arms an, a collection, an arsenal, a Lubomirsky's uh, arsenal, and uh, partially it has been relocated to the arsenal at the Pidvanna Street. I could not uh, uh, st start analyzing uh, individual items and how and where they were moved after the war. It could be a topic for an entire new research. 
And there was also a Lubomirsky Museum with the Historical and Memorial Department where they collected art representing genealogy of Polish noble families, especially the founding uh, fathers' families. The artistic values of these uh, pictures were dominated by the memorial function. There was also an art gallery, uh, even from the today's uh, understanding, and the best uh, pictures from there were robbed and uh, driven away by the Nazis uh, during the Second World War. There was also a manuscript section. It's uh, the Bilovsky Hall. It's a part of the li uh, of the library, very uh, well known to the researchers who work with manuscripts in the Stefanik Library. I should also mention that publishing was a part of this uh, educational work uh, which was going on in the Osolinum Institute, and this is a publishing logo of Osolinum. We also know that there is a publishing house in the library which is still functioning, and I uh, used to uh, print my abstract of my dissertation there uh, some time ago. It's still functioning. Before the Second World War, the Osolinam Library had 220,000 volumes, over 6,000 manuscripts, over 9,000 authors' uh, autographs, over 2,000 diplomas, and also over 3,000 historical maps. Munchinsky Gidushitsky Library. Uh, excuse me. A so called Potozitska Library which was established in Lviv in 1857. It was a library collected in Potorica, uh, a countryside estate, by uh, a family of Didushitsky, uh, by Yusef Didushitsky and Volodymyr Didushitsky. Uh, much later, the library was transferred to Lviv, and it was located in Didushitsky uh, Palace on uh, in Kurkova Street. It was before the war. Now it's Lysenka st Street. Right now, uh, there is something going on in there that you cannot get in in and photograph it. That's why I'm showing you the old picture of the palace. The library had 50,000 volumes, mostly on Polish history and literature. There was also a Didushetsky Museum um, that Volodymyr Didushetsky um, made his best to develop. He started to collect natural history uh, items, uh, something which was outside art history and social history. But there was also natural history, like zoology, botany, paleontology, geology, mineralogy, uh, prehistoric uh, studies, and ethnography. At the same time, even that was collected uh, at Didushetsky Museum. It used to be a simple room in Didushetsky's uh, palace at uh, Kurkova Lysenka Street. But then later, in 1894, uh, this large building on, uh, in Teatrana Street, which used to be a residential building, it was purchased by Didoshetsky and then reconstructed into a museum. R uh, now it's a, a state natural history museum at the Academy of Science. Uh, it's working uh, now. It has always had problems with funding. Where did these museums get money? 
before the creation of the Second Polish Republic and in the Habsburg Empire. The owners of uh, the collections in these museums uh, sent a certain share of their income from their estates to keep the museums going. This is how they created ordinations uh, because the the estates uh, did not were not inherited uh, by other generations. They were kept to serve an entire project, as we would call it today. And there were a few of such ordinations or projects. The Bavorovsky uh, Museum and Library existed in 1850. It was established by Viktor Bavorovsky. He was a poet and bibliophile. He collected books, maps, diplomas, manuscripts. And he established a municipal library in a former Sinyavsky arsenal. This is a 17th century uh, building which used to be outside uh, the city. Uh, today it's uh, quite close to the Polytechnic University. This building was uh, refurbished in the 19th, in the 1830s uh, into an empire building. And this is where they located these collections, because there were a few of them. Right now, it's an art palace uh, named uh, after Omelian and Tetyana Antonovich. And they are a family of uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainians uh, by origin who live in the United States. And they donated a large amount of money to keep this library, which was closed because of financial problems in 2003. And right now, uh, with the help of Osolinam, it's coming to life again. That library had about 40,000 volumes, 35 incunabulous among them, S over 6,000 prints from the 16th and 17th century, 1,200 manuscripts, 10,000 etchings, 500 diplomas, 60 illuminated gradules, and they are scores for singing, and over 1,000 autographs. There was another collection, a Pavlikovsky collection, which was um, transferred to uh, the Osolinaum in 1921. It was also a family collection uh, brought together by a few generations. It was started by Joseph uh, Pavlikovsky, a mayor of uh, Przemysl at the uh, beginning of, um, at the end of the 18th century. He transferred it uh, from Medica, from his uh, countryside estate, to the city to bring it closer to the people who could use it. Uh, Yusuf Gualbert Pavlikovsky was a historian who lived in the uh, 20th uh, century. Since the uh, middle of 19th century until 1940, the library was located in the Dominican master, monastery. I ha we have talked about it before, that the monasteries were canceled by Joseph uh, II, uh, and they were standing empty, or they were filled ad hoc uh, according to needs. However, later, there was a special building built for the collection. It was on the 3rd of May Street, and now it's Sitchevistrilzi uh, Street. Uh, under number five, there was a special wing which went on to the uh, courtyard of that building. And then, uh, since uh, 1895, the collection was transferred to Ossolin now. It can, uh, contained 26,000 volumes, 271 manuscripts, and so on. There was also a municipal industrial museum and library.
And now we have a different uh, Athos and a different story. It's a municipal museum. It was a museum created, created not as a private collection, but specifically for the city of Lviv. The museum was started by two prominent engineers and architects. One of them was a, a court counselor, Ludwig Wyszbicki. He was also a director of a Lviv ra railway and the uh, author of uh, the first Lviv railway station uh, and other railway stations uh, in other cities, like in Chernivtsi. The other one was Julian Zaharevich. He was a founder of an architectural discipline in the Polytechnic uh, University. He, was, he served as a dean and then as a rector of Lviv Polytechnic. They have transferred large collections and libraries of specialized books and periodicals which uh, cost a lot at that time because they were heavily illustrated. There were not a lot of uh, photographs and re reproductions. Uh, there were lithographs and etchings and all these illustrated publications. Uh, in uh, uh, They were a large volume and they were quite costly. These two men transferred these collections to the Industrial Museum in Lviv, which was established in 1874 uh, thanks to their efforts. And starting 1905, the building um, uh, was transferred uh, together with uh, other ethnographic collections. At that time, there was no clear-cut borderline between art and applied uh, industrial art. There was no design or industrial design at that time. That's why applied arts seemed to be part of, in of the industry, however, spread out uh, across a certain territory. And that was part of the Austrian uh, state uh, policy to um, uh, give us something uh, to give people something to do at the time when they are not uh, busy with agriculture like in winter uh, so that people could produce something which we now call a folk art and which we see in Kosmach and Kosiv and other small towns in the Carpathians and all these collections of this art of this craft were collected and uh, very carefully in order to mainstream this this newly born craft into a certain artistic uh, um, a stream. It was not a very rich collection. They only had uh, one and a half thousand volumes and one thousand two hundred uh, archings. But uh, uh, judging from the uh, their large format and uh, illustrations, uh, it was quite costly collection. We know that right now it's a museum of ethnography and folk art at the Academy of Science of Ukraine, and the museum is now located in the former Galician uh, 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 bank. It was a building built by Yulian Zakharevich uh, to be uh, to serve as a bank. And we know that in the, uh, in that other building uh, used to be Lenin Museum uh, during the Soviet times, and right now it's the Ukrainian National Museum. Uh, Lviv History Museum was another municipal museum created as a museum of the history of Lviv, later turned into uh, King Jan uh, Sobieski III Museum. It was in 1908. Here, uh, uh, the national identity comes to the forward. 
because you were speaking at the beginning peoples and national has a lot of meaning and sometimes people apply different meanings to the words which have existed since long time ago the museum is located in Kornyakt building or Sobieski Palace in uh, Renok Square uh, 6. In uh, between 1908 and 1939, it was Jan Sobieski National Museum. And we all know the wonderful Italian patio, which is inside which has created uh, a certain background with the help of municipal history to present certain uh, artifacts which survived and which the curators want to show to the visitors. National uh, Gallery of the City of Lviv, established in 1907, and the idea to establish an art gallery in Lviv uh, came to be quite um, a, a long time ago. And starting in 1914, the library uh, found its permanent location in uh, the Luzinski uh, castle. He was a legendary person. He was an editor of the Lviv Gazette. He was a member of the Academy of Sciences in Krakow. After he died, his nephew sold this large building to the city. However, w with it, the city also got quite a large and interesting collections uh, by Lozinski. In 1897, the municipality decided to create the gallery. In 1902, they bought uh, the first paintings. In 1907, uh, they bought a very important collection by Jan Jakovic. He was a, a, a nobleman who used to live in Podilla, and in his collection he had um, uh, uh, art by Raphael, Rembrandt, Van Dyck, Velasquez, and Watteau. The majority of them turned out to be originals, not fake, and that's exactly what made the gallery so famous. In 1907, it was launched, and its first curator was a Polish artist, Marceli Gerasimowicz, who served there until 1931. Much later, in 1938, other private collections uh, by Leon Pininski and Konstantin Brunicki were donated to the museum. And here are a few of the first um, artifacts of the museum, something which created its atmosphere and spirit, which still makes it so interesting today. This is the art of the, uh, the, the then contemporary Polish art, which reflected on the events of the Polish uh, uh, identity, uh, looking uh, to restore the Polish state and other social uh, and cultural issues which were raised in, these, uh, in this art. These are some of the uh, first paintings bought by the gallery, the Philistines, or something painted under the influence of uh, Romanticism, um, trying to connect with the peasants, with the roots of the Polish uh, people as they were understood at that time. This is how Ladislav Lozinski used to look like. The holes which were designed uh, during his lifetime look very much alike. Um, um, and they still keep uh, this spirit uh, in the uh, Boris Woznicki um, gallery. A part of that uh, gallery uh, was uh, Ratzlawicka panorama, which was uh, painted in 1894 to commemorate the battle at Ratzlawice, where Kostushko defeated the Russian army. 
this building uh, you know it as a, a reconstructed building it's now in Strisky Park uh, right now it serves uh, a sports center for Lviv Polytechnic University um, uh, that was the time when it was very popular to build panoramas because it was part of a cultural landscape of a city. There was no cinema at that time, so people would come to places like this to show a 3D art because at the forefront there were uh, um, fences and houses built and then the battle was happening at the background and around. After the war uh, the Raslavitska panorama got a special building. It was transferred to Poland to the city of Wroclaw where it remains today. The collection by Leon Pilninski was another private collection. He was a wealthy historian, historian of uh, the Roman law. He served as a Lviv governor. He was very conservative, succeeded by Potocki on, uh, in the office. And he was the owner of Pilninski Palace on, uh, in Mateka Street. One uh, of the uh, rare streets which kept its uh, pre-war name and it hosted a small uh, art gallery which in the 1920s was transferred partially to the Wawel Museum uh, in Krakow, a large museum which was re reproduced in the barracks occupied by the Austrian army. And then at the times of the Second Polish Republic, they became a symbol of uh, the cultural renaissance of the Polish state. Uh, Janusz Lugosz Museum, uh, which belonged to Roman Catholic Archdiocese. As we can see that in addition to the municipality and private collectors, church was also collecting art and libraries. We know this uh, cathedral, which is now located in Venechenko uh, Street, and there is a monastery uh, next to it. Uh, back at that time, it hosted this collection. There were other museums as well, as well. for example, Recordel Museum, the Technology Museum, which was opened in 1916 in uh, the contemporary Tchaikovsky Street, right next to the Philharmonix. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of the interior, but I think it was quite an interesting museum. There were other private collections, like Stanislav Zarevich's collection, who rented a a, uh, an apartment at the uh, in modern Krushenlitska Street, and his uh, collection was in a different uh, place in Nova Street, uh, Sweet Street, but it was a prominent collect, uh, collection, uh, and Bogdan Janusz even wrote an extensive review of it uh, for the Zemia uh, magazine. Uh, we are now moving on to the Ukrainian collections. As we can see, that these collections were um, coming out of their national environment. In the, I use the term national in the meaning uh, it had in the, uh, in the early 20th century. They were not uh, statehood nations. They were ethnic nations who were striving for uh, independence the people's house and the library the uh, the russian uh, 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 institute which is not far from here on in tatrana street it used to be a trinitary monastery which was in quite a bad condition and then uh, Franz Joseph II, a young emperor at that time, he donated the building to the Lviv community for their behavior uh, in 1848, and he allowed 
to build a Ukrainian people's uh, house there. He not only allowed to, uh, them to do it, he also took part in setting a cornerstone stone in 1857, when it was just uh, uh, starting. Uh, this event, even though it had a national coloring, it was also very patriotic from the uh, view of the Habsburg Empire. Um, so uh, today, Franz Joseph stays, remains with uh, his uh, Ukrainian community, and this is the present that he gives them. Um, Story Pigeon uh, Institute Museum and Library was established in 1889 by Professor Isidor Sharanovich. He was a historian, a professor, an anthropologist. The character of that collection was quite Moscow fill. Uh, or uh, Slav uh, Slav uh, Slavic fill. It was um, uh, presenting the folklore items of that time, uh, the items which connected the history of local Ukrainian Galician uh, community with a larger Slavic community. And uh, especially there were uh, old friends there and other archeological findings which came to uh, arrive there, for example, from the uh, uh, princess city of Harlech. Uh, there was also the scientific society, uh, Shevchenko Scientific Society. Uh, this uh, organization is closely connected with Ukrainian culture and science and education of the Ukrainian society. However, as a researcher of Jewish art, I would like to emphasize that they were never limited to narrow nationalistic artistic uh, terms, and they were interested in Jewish architecture. For example, this uh, wooden synagogue in Yuzdudich was, uh, this picture was made by Volodymyr Sichensky and it's now uh, kept in an uh, ethnographical museum. And we are sure about it because there is a stamp of the Shevchenko Scientific Society on the back of the p uh, photograph. Uh, the largest uh, Ukrainian museum was a church museum, later turned into a national museum, established uh, by Andrei Sheptetsky uh, in 1909. We know very well who Andrei Sheptetsky was, and we respect his um, legacy in uh, social, religious, and cultural domains. And his role in establishing this museum was very important. It was focal. This is what he said uh, when he opened this museum. In God's name, by opening this national museum, we are giving it all to our people, our young people, uh, contemporary and future. We want this museum to be a focal point of culture and researcher, research. And this is another important quote explaining what a national museum is, what are different senses uh, put by Metropolitan Sheptetsky into the term national. An important role in the development of national art can, can and should be played by a national museum, a museum which keeps the national tradition and keeps everything of importance in the national life by its character, type, artistic style, or by the expression, or by national thought or national life. The museum helps national artists in every direction. It means not only painters, sculptors, musicians, and artists, but also craftsmen who can uh, find their own way in 
their creativity. The museum's collection is an example of what national character is for an artist. As we can see, this is not an opinion of a religious leader, but uh, more, uh, rather uh, an act uh, romanticism um, activist, because at that time, representatives of all the communities, Polish, Ukrainian, and Jewish, believed that the, f the future art will be built on the past art, and it's a paradigm which is going to change in the uh, in the uh, next few uh, decades uh, due to the uh, circumstances which did not depend uh, on either Ukrainians, Poles or Jews, but simply on the development of global art. For the museum, they bought Don the Donikovsky Palace on Drahomanova Street and they opened it in 1913 as a museum. The first custodian of that museum was Ilarion Svensitsky, a prominent researcher and art uh, uh, researcher. And this is uh, the first exposition of Ukrainian art in that museum. And I should mention that Osolinaum and other museums played an important role uh, in uh, education and publishing. And so uh, the Museum of Ukrainian Art also published an art uh, magazine called L'Art, which was edited by the Greek Catholic Theological Academy established in 1922. Uh, this institution also had its own collection. I'm not going to tell you uh, the history of it. I will show you the venue. It used to be located in the university building. Uh, there was also a Holy Spirit uh, church there, which had a bell tower. But then in 1925, one of the bombs landed on the building and then the library got destroyed. The church was never rebuilt, despite the fact that there were a few uh, bids to rebuild it. There is uh, now only uh, a, pla a plaque which reminds us of the building and the collection. There was also a Brazilian library in St. Onufrius uh, Monastery. It has quite a long-standing tradition because this is the place where the first printer, Ivan Fedorov, used to, to live and died. Uh, it was quite a big library at that time and much later it was a collection of uh, a print prints uh, by Lviv uh, Art Gallery. We are moving on to Armenian collections. The Armenian community was, was, was much smaller and much poorer than the Polish and the Ukrainian communities. Despite that fact, since 1932, they wanted to establish their own museum and they did a lot uh, in that respect. Um, this man, Bogdan Janusz, he is Ukrainian by origin. He was an art critic and uh, an uh, erudite. He didn't live very long. And there was another person, uh, Archbishop uh, Yusef Teodorovich. His palace was right next to the museum building, and it was done by the Armenian community archdiocese community of Armenians, which was a, um, a society organization. However, it worked under the umbrella of uh, a bishop. Uh, in uh, the next building, this is the bishop's palace, uh, the next building uh, was supposed to host the Armenian Museum, but it was never launched. However, the Armenian collection 
was quite a rich. For example, this is a page of a, a so-called Skvarsk Lviv uh, gospel. It's a memorial of from the 12th uh, century. It disappeared during the war and then was miraculously found in Gdansk. It is now located in the National Library in Warsaw. But in 1940, all the uh, collections from the non-existent Armenian Museum was, uh, were transferred to Lviv Art Gallery and Historical Museum. We are now moving to the Jewish collections. They uh, have been of interest to me for a while and that's why I have more about them. I tried to keep a balance but it's in my lecture but it's important because the riches of these communities could be compared but it's, it uh, varies a lot by its number and quality. I should uh, stress that Jewish art at the very beginning was only uh, used uh, in the liturgical or everyday uh, context. It was never a social um, element. It was not meant uh, to be presented in the museum. For example, the Torah uh, crown from one of the Lviv uh, synagogues uh, it was documented only in 1925, but it was exhibited even before that, where uh, they uh, showed Jewish um, art. They showed art to Jews who were not uh, interested to, uh, in religion anymore and to the non-Jews. The beginnings of private collections look very much like the beginnings of Polish collections. They were people who stood out, among others, by their wealth, started to, to collect uh, important things, just like the Polish nobility did. This is Mauritius Nierenstein. He was a banker from Brode who moved to Lviv and he bought a building of uh, old uh, post office and he started to collect different art uh, artifacts and historical artifacts there he knew that he was from a very prominent jewish family from the uh, family of mayor katzenlenbogen and uh, his mother's name was Val, and you know that Shaul Val, it's, uh, it's a very famous name, a Polish king for a knight. So he made a, a business card for himself, and he wrote there, Mayor, the son of Joseph Joshua Nierenstein, from the family, so family, from the family famous in Israel, Hamam Tzvi Ashkenazi, and Mayor Katzenelen Bogen, the, re the rabbi in Padua, the family of Isaiah, and from the house of King David. I think it's quite, uh, it's not, it's, uh, it's quite modest uh, to my mind. In his collection, he had different items. He, uh, one of the pictures he believed to be painted by Rembrandt, uh, which was later sent to Vienna uh, for an expertise, and it was found out it was not Rembrandt. However, uh, he believed that it was an original Rembrandt. It was his Rembrandt. He was a famous um, because he was an owner of a Roka, uh, blown glass factory, but he did not become a, a capitalist. He did not start a mass production. He had a certain artistic taste in everything. 
he uh, took uh, art classes from Francis Shaktepa and the blue arrows show the items produced in Rokwa. He had a very rich imagination. He would produce uh, two uh, uh, vodka glasses which were connected by the uh, bottom uh, and where it would be written uh, drink it up and uh, pour again. And there were uh, also uh, different patriotic slogans on the bottles. The family wanted him to uh, do business more. However, he spent his time on uh, collecting things. However, uh, his later generations of his family, for example, Adolf Lilian, who later uh, married the daughter of Mauritius Nierenstein, he is the owner of the bank which is next to the Vienna cafe today. He was a person who led quite an aristocratic lifestyle uh, in uh, the context of the contemporary uh, Poland and uh, Austria. He was a military guy. He had a countryside villa on Sofivka. He had uh, the horse stables. He had a countryside house where his family spent the summer, and he had wonderful collections who were not who were um, uh, left um, to be inherited by her sons. But then, after the Soviet power came here, most of the collections were simply thrown away, and the museum on uh, I forgot what what the street was called. It's uh, a side street from Franka Street, Yaroslavenka Street, uh, that's right. And it looks much, much uh, worse. It has been divided into apartments and so on. We now come back to Vizhbitsky and Zakharevich, who established the Municipal Industrial Museum. We talked about them as founders of the museum, but they were also interested in Judaism and documented them. For example, Vizhbitsky documented a wooden synagogue in Yabunov, and he documented uh, wall paintings on uh, in the synagogue, and then he published it in Krakow together with his colleagues who helped him to uh, transcribe the dates and the uh, quotes um, there. Zaharievich was also interested in Jewish art. He designed and built uh, the temple synagogue in Chernivtsi. It was uh, located in front of the uh, polytechnic building in a little bit uh, different style, a little bit African and um, Mauritanian. Uh, uh, to Zaharevich's uh, mind, it suited uh, the the building. He was also connected to traditional uh, paper cutouts, Jewish cutouts. Um, um, the, uh, the explanation could be that he was looking for motives for his architectural ideas, just as well as we can assume that Vizhbitsky was documenting synagogues uh, to have a certain number of Jewish topics uh, should he decide to work for uh, a Jewish uh, client. The Jewish art was represented at the Galicia County Fair in 1894, and it was a great event in the history of the city. That was the year that a tram line was built from the uh, railway station to the uh, fair uh, venue. And for the first time at the fair, at the um, layman's, uh, uh, for the layman's community, the, uh, there were presented religious, Jewish religious items, which were out of their uh, 
traditional context, outside their liturgical context. Only a person who knew how it functions could know when and where they were produced, in what artistic uh, environment they were born, because we uh, could see a typical uh, Lviv things and Vienna things and uh, things from Brode. Um, there were also large uh, private libraries, at least three of them, three Jewish libraries. There was a uh, Solomon Buber's library. He was a head of the Lviv Jewish community, but also grandfather of a great uh, 20th century philosopher, Martin Buber. Uh, Simon von Gorowitz was a great uh, political actus, uh, activist who um, uh, donated his collections to the National Library. And this is the portrait of Bernard Lovenstein, a rabbi of, uh, at the synagogue. As we can see, these people come from different uh, backgrounds, even if in the same Jewish community. And that's why their collections were different. And it is even more interesting that they were transferred to the Lviv Community Library, which is located at the former Riznitska Street, later renamed into Nalavaika Street. It contained 6,300 volumes in 1936. Uh, 1904, sorry. There was also a smaller collection of uh, private albums of uh, uh, famous Jewish families in a Jewish community house on Benstein Street, now called Shalom Aleyhem Street, and it was uh, a large private, there was another large uh, private collection by Maximilian Goldstein. He was a bank uh, officer who worked at Lillian's bank. You can see a photograph with an old and an, a new building of the bank. And it's uh, a picture that his employees uh, presented to their boss. We can see Goldstein as a young man here. This is what Goldstein collected at the beginning. As a bank officer, he collected uh, coins and medals. It's very interesting to see how he built up his identity. For example, he represents a medal dedicated to Samuel Gorowitz and the medal dedicated to Julius Slavatsky. He was the first one to suggest there should be a Jewish museum uh, should be created in Lviv. It happened in 1910. He wrote a few articles and he created society for the support of this museum, which uh, was c consisted of himself and uh, sculptor Joachim Kana. But this initiative was never supported uh, by the Levites before the First World War. And the collection remained in his private ownership up until the beginning of the Second World War when it was confiscated. This is Maximilian Goldstein uh, in his collection, which uh, was occupying more and more space in his uh, house. In 1935, he published a book. It wasn't a catalog. It was something, uh, as Meyer Balaban wrote in the foreword, it was more of a key for the people who don't know anything about Jewish art uh, and who want to dive into them. So it was for the layman, um, for, we can see what, what was Goldstein so famous for? Not only because he, he was a collector, but he was also a selfish man. He liked presents with inscriptions, with dedications to him and his family. And maybe that was the reason why he never be, was uh, a founder of a municipal museum. And there was another group of people who took the leadership of the circle created of uh, Goldstein before the war. 
and one of such people was Yusuf Aben, an, an architect. We know uh, his wonderful buildings that he built in Lviv, but he was also interested and he wrote a lot, a lot about preserving Jewish art and culture, and he would uh, publish his works in Polish and German. Another person was Marek Reichenstein. He was a, 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 a military doctor who left his practice after the First World War at the Lviv University Clinic. And he's starting collecting Jewish art. And he had enough uh, financial means because he was a successful doctor. Uh, so he was able to buy quite expensive items not even of Lviv origin. That is his difference from Goldstein, who was more interested in local products. For example, he bought, uh, we don't know where, a collection of Italian uh, uh, um, of uh, uh, Ketuba, um, uh, marriage uh, contracts. This collection remains up until today, and part of it is now on uh, exhibit in the uh, art gallery. There were also important Jewish art events. There was, in 1928, there was a book exhibition, uh, a Lviv book exhibition. It was a general exhibition prepared by Reichenstein. But at the same time, there was an exhibition of Jewish books with uh, its catalog published. This exhibition uh, took place in the Jewish community house on uh, the contemporary Shalom Alehem Street uh, under number 12. This exhibition was well documented by a special circle created to protect Jewish art at uh, the Lviv uh, religion. Um, religion uh, community. It was a curatorship over the Jewish art. And they uh, were uh, the founders of this curat uh, curatorium. Among the first things w uh, in there, uh, it was the Rackenstein's uh, collection and this exhibition and a lot of uh, cemeteries and synagogues. In 1931, uh, there was started uh, a society of friends of Jewish Museum, and then all the leadership of the curatorium uh, moved to this society. But then in 1932, Reichenstein died, and his widow, Ada Reichenstein, who was a prominent public uh, activist who uh, created a series of uh, female and charity organizations, um, for example, Vizo, she decided to transfer this collection to the Jewish Museum in Lviv. And at the Reichenstein's funeral, she asked the community not to spend money on flowers, but instead make an offer for the Jewish Museum and for other charity events. She herself donated 300 slotters, which was quite a big amount of money at that time. However, at the same time, there were other events uh, outside the Avin and Reichenstein's and Curatorium Circle. For example, the, the Industrial Museum hosted an exhibition of Judaica in 1933, where Goldstein also participated, but also the curatorium uh, members. These two societies didn't like each other very much. And Goldstein's book from 1935, you will find no mention of Avon whatsoever, as if he never existed. There was one mention of Reichenstein, but in the uh, but not in Goldstein's text, but in Balaban's uh, foreword. And in 1934, uh, at Bernstein Street, there was a museum opened on the upper floor. 
The elements of this museum existed in the building from the very beginning of the, uh, the establishment of uh, the community house because it hosted a gallery of rabbis' uh, portraits and Jewish leaders' portraits. For example, the portrait of Isaac Label Schmelkin or Leib Horowitz, uh, a portrait who donated his library to the city. And then in 1934, they added a few more halls and a corridor on the upper floor. And at the center of this exhibition were items from Reichenstein's collection. There was a special hall dedicated to his name, but there were other items as well. The director of this um, uh, the curator of this museum was Ludwig Lille. That's uh, how we are used to call him, even Lille, because he uh, emigrated to France in 1933, and then he fought in the French resistance, and he survived, and then created another collection in France. He was a Fauvism uh, artist, which also uh, gave a certain spirit to his collection, which included both uh, ritual uh, items from synagogues, synagogues. You can see the Torah um, uh, covers here and everyday uh, life items here, uh, something that were also present in the Goldstein's collection. Uh, another interesting thing were sketches for the synagogue paintings, uh, for Lviv synagogues. And they were sent for the approval to the Jewish community, and they remain there. For example, this cardboard sketch by Mauritius Flack for a large uh, suburban synagogue, which later, you know, um, was destroyed uh, during the pogrom of 1918. And of course, a central place in the collection was uh, the collection of Reichenstein and his ketuba. However, uh, it was uh, the documentation was done by the curatorium, and it never stopped up until the war. It was also located in the museum. It was a documentation of the uh, gravestones, photographs of pictures. There were also uh, some quite uh, ethnographic items, like children's masks for the Purim holiday and paper cutouts. They planned to turn this museum into uh, a modern, a Jewish modern art museum, but this never happened. There was also quite a good museum guide, which was free uh, for the public. It was uh, open most days uh, of the week, except for the Sabbath. And since the museum was a public institution, it uh, reported before the Polish authorities about the availability of certain items so that we know what was there. To uh, sum up, let me just say a few words about the fate of Jewish collections of Lviv. All of them were nationalized in 1939, and it was Goldstein who led the nationalization of Jewish Museum, and then his own collection uh, uh, ended up in the Museum of Ethnography, and later it was divided and spread out. Uh, depending on uh, the material, the papers to papers, silver to silver, art to art, and so this collection was divided among Lviv museums. The first person who had access and interest and who started to exhibit uh, these items was Faina Petrakova, who was a, a curator of the faience items in uh, the museum, but she got to know Judaica pretty soon. 
and um, uh, her uh, background knowledge helped her a lot in studying these uh, items in the collection from the collections of Goldstein and uh, the museum. Uh, the selected items from the Judaica collection um, at the Museum of Ethnography were presented at the museum and then they toured abroad in Krakow, in Tel Aviv, and later uh, in other cities, uh, in particular in Austria. And the last uh, big finding is a collection of the Ketuba. Uh, who were uh, um, in who were hidden under some uh, theater posters and they were discovered uh, by the late Boris Voznitsky. He was impressed by them and he wanted to show them but he didn't uh, have time. And we, the researchers of the Viv Art Gallery and of the Jewish University in uh, Jerusalem, I think we managed to uh, make quite a good exhibition and to uh, commemorate the name of Marek Rankenstein. As to the building of the Jewish Museum, it's dying. Uh, now it's owned by the Jewish community now, uh, who doesn't pay a lot of attention to it. At a certain time, the roof collapsed and the electricity was shut off, and the organization which, uh, which were inside left it. And thanks to the GIZ, a German uh, cooperation, uh, uh, organization they managed to repair it but it's only a temporary solution because uh, the work the uh, repairs was quite sporadic now the building is surrounded uh, with uh, um, uh, these construction uh, things but I don't know what the function of them uh, are Thank you for attention. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, we have time for a few questions and comments. Please raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. We have two hands. You are welcome. Thank you for the wonderful story. At the beginning, uh, you mentioned that there were some noble uh, reflections on their own uh, origin and on the origins of other people. My question is to, about that. Who had a chance to use these museums and how did the circle of people who had access to them changed as the time passed? Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful, interesting question. In fact, the people who transferred their collections to the people, they wanted uh, uh, the access to be as wide as possible. That's why uh, it, uh, they were open to a wide uh, a public, to the art, to the manuscripts. Of course, during Soviet time, a lot of t uh, a lot of items were confiscated. For example, I first saw Balaban's uh, books in a special uh, room in Stefanik Library where I needed to bring uh, special uh, cred uh, accreditation and letters to be allowed to go in there and work with them. But the, the, uh, these aristocracy uh, people, uh, the noblemen, they wanted uh, to have general access. Said he, thank you for a wonderful re review. You divided these collections into national co um, collections, Ukrainian, Polish, Jewish, and Armenian. How conscious 
uh, how uh, how conscious was this understanding of the museum landscape uh, back then? Uh, did these categories exist at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century? But moreover, how did they perceive this landscape? How did the collectioners um, build their relations? Uh, did they have a similar or different um, interests? Uh, were they competing or were they cooperating? And did they see their uh, audience as the same audience or different? Thank you for your question. I think at the beginning, the view on the national, nationality of these collections was quite existential. No one would collect something which does not belong to the history of your people. Of course, there were antique collectors and researchers, uh, Poles, for example, who were interested in Jewish art. But there was a theory behind it, a theory which was voiced by one of the first art historians in Poland, Stanislaw Kostka Potocki who thought that uh, people like Jews are carriers of a certain ancient art, ancient culture, which has not been created here. And thanks to their extraordinary conser uh, conservatism, and because they are more interested in finance matters, they simply don't have time and uh, money to bring their art up to the level of, uh, for example, Polish art. I'm not speaking of the Italian art. It was an Orientalist view on Jewish art, Orientalism in, uh, in Said's terms. And with time, this view on the Jewish art uh, simply uh, deepened at the end of the 18th century. The Department of Art History at Jagiellonian University uh, looked at Jewish art as a, a, fl a fly uh, in an aspect. But this was the same opinion they had about the Ukrainian art as the art of a very conservative group. And they were looking for the difference between the dynamic Western art and the conservatism of the separated um, uh, group, ethnic group, uh, frozen in aspect. Uh, that's why they were so interested, for example, in paintings in synagogues, but they never paid attention to the Baroque elements in Jewish arts, because Baroque would contradict the thought about the ancient character of this art. It's changed with the flow of time, and Jews themselves started to be interested in their art, but it only happened in the early 20th century. It happened to Balaban, it happened to these collectors and other people who were interested and who wanted to study uh, art history. As to the division into the el el elitist and uh, mass art, it's a very important issue, especially in the Polish Athos. At the beginning of the 19th century, gentry viewed their culture as Sarmatian uh, culture and peasants' culture as a peasants' culture as uh, belonging to a different eth uh, ethnic uh, community. And bridging the gap only happened at the end of the 19th century with the introduction of a Zakopi Zakopiane style as a Polish folk art which was capable of uniting the entire uh, nation. That was uh, the force of uh, Vespiansky's uh, wedding um, a play, where there is a wedding between a noble guy and a peasant girl. And this idea uh, overcame not only the Poles, but also Ukrainians and others. As to the jealousy and competitiveness, 
uh, between the collectioners. Uh, it's it's quite a common thing because uh, uh, Goldstein was jealous of Reichenstein. Reichenstein didn't uh, uh, envy anyone because he was a doctor and he knew the value of life. Um, but that influenced the quality of their collections. Thank you, said he. I am uh, Sidhi Chandabai. I am head of the Natural History Museum. Thank you for the information about our institution. I would like to add that in addition to our collection, there is another one in Lviv. It's a fantastic collection by Professor Benedict Dybowski. Uh, as a logical museum in the university, it's a Eurasian uh, fauna uh, from um, Kamchatka uh, to, the, uh, to the Caucasus. When he was uh, there in the exile, he collected these things, and I recommend you to go and see this museum. My question is different, though. Uh, could we hear something else about the collections of Boroslav and Drohobych Novorish uh, uh, people, people who, who got rich on oil? And as far as I know, these people were collecting something as well. Even the Natural History Museum in Boroslav um, was created by a, a capitalist uh, Yarosh, who unfortunately uh, uh, after 1939 disappeared and nobody have known anything about it since then. Could you say uh, something about it? Thank you. Thank you. I am in love with your museum uh, since I was my, a little boy. Uh, I was in love with an eight pond uh, rabbit with a mammoth. I brought my children there. My little son was crying uh, over uh, a dismantled uh, a turtle. He was very sorry for it. He took it all very personally. Your museum is, is wonderful. As to the uh, Drohovich collections, I have no knowledge of their fate. A part of my family is also originally from Drohovich. It's a distant family uh, of uh, engineer folks. He owned a building which is now a post office right next to the cathedral. I have not heard anything about the collections. His wife, oh, my uh, aunt Lotka, uh, used to tell me how she learned to paint uh, from Bruno Schultz. However, in 1939, they were sent to Siberia. And then in the middle uh, of the uh, way, they spent a war uh, in the middle of nowhere because he was a good oil engineer but they never told us about any, no collection, art collections. I assume they simply disappeared if they existed at all. I am more interested in the fate of the Jewish house in Drohobych, who was built uh, at the design of Yusuf Avin, whom I mentioned, and now there is nothing on that, on that place, and I cannot find a single picture of that uh, building. And if you happen to know anything, I would be very grateful. Sirhi, could you please tell us what are the prospects or possibilities, because I know there are projects and ideas like that to reopen the Jewish Museum in Lviv. Do you see a, a, a prospect for that? Thank you. I think there is always a possibility. We have discussed this at the yesterday's meeting here. We need to have a good concept and a good program so that we could uh, take this huge 
uh, endeavor uh, off the ground. And I think there were a lot of organizational issues in it because the collection of the museum was divided between different uh, institutions. It's in different uh, depositories. And it would take a lot of efforts to get them back because nobody would give away public uh, collection items um, uh, back on under no circumstances but i think if there is a good will it's very possible to to do it i believe it is uh, good evening thank you Dvanislava chabanlaus our writer and my question is about a very prominent figure we talked about somebody who is connected with theology and philosophy and art and museums and he was um, a great man uh, metropolitan andrei sheptetsky and sometimes tourists uh, ask me about the monument of andrei sheptetsky in israel which was built much earlier than the one in lviv and it was ruined it was the destroyed. Uh, could you tell us anything about it since you came from there? Thank you for the question. I don't really know a lot about this monument, but I have heard about the problem because five years ago, when I was at the World uh, Judaica Congress, we had a special session dedicated to Andrei Sheptitsky and his memory in Israel. And there were uh, people who uh, spoke there, people who knew his uh, uh, his uh, um, inclusion to the um, list of um, uh, saints of the world. It's a very weird story because his attitude to Jews and his deeds as a savior of Jews are well known. We need to remember, as far as I remember from uh, the talks I heard then, some people in Yad Vashem Council had uh, such great psychological, personal and family trauma from the time of the war that they were blocking all sorts of, of uh, steps uh, in that direction. They were people who had their own feelings. Now there has been a change in generations and in a few weeks there will be the next uh, uh, conference like that where I would imagine there will be a similar session and maybe I will be there, I will definitely be there, maybe I will even be invited to chair one of the sessions, but then I think I would know much more uh, on what's going on uh, five years later. Because the association uh, Ukrainian Jewish meetings uh, located in Canada does a lot uh, to solve this uh, issue uh, in a most dignified way. Um, I would like to say that your lecture was very interesting. Lots of people didn't know anything, and some people knew a lot. Let me just say a few words about our lecturer, because Sergei, he is uh, originally from Lviv, from a large family. His uncle was a chief artist of a Jewish magazine in Moscow. His father was a professor at Polytechnic Institute. He himself, when he was 25, 26, he started to research synagogues. And I'm very happy to see him here 
He came to me and we started this work together. Uh, back at the Soviet times, Sergei and I, we spoke at the Museum of Religion here, and we took everyone who wanted to know uh, about the synagogue, about our Lviv synagogue. It uh, received a certain fame at, uh, at that time. I am extremely happy that Sergei does not forget our city. Maybe it's, it's better for him that he left for Israel and now he's, not, he's lecturing not only in Lviv but all over the world. And he uh, has a lot of publications and I'm very happy and grateful uh, to you, my uh, dear colleague, my dear uh, student. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I should say that um, I'm, I mostly speak to Hebrew, uh, who uh, taught me uh, Hebrew, Bete Alexandrovna on Vuhilna Street in 1993-94. It was my second uh, um, arrival to Hebrew. The first one was very uh, weird. Roman Mohetic gave me a, a textbook from the Austrian gymnasium uh, in uh, Hebrew, which belonged to him, a uh, grandfather. I had a double problem. I didn't know German, but I was trying to learn Hebrew. Uh, my last question is very theoretical and philosophical, because we had quite a heated discussion here about what Jewish museums are needed in Eastern Europe. Believe is Eastern Europe. What we also heard yesterday is the exhibitions are so well planned uh, in many museums so that you can predict what feelings the visitors would come out with. Here's my question. Imagine for a while you are a director of a new Jewish museum in Lviv. What should be the thoughts and feelings that visitors visitors would come out with uh, from that museum? It's a very difficult question, and uh, it's hard to answer it. Let me just say that this is a very difficult thing to uh, start a Jewish museum, to program it, to design it. From my own experience, I know that when in 2008 I was driving from Kazimierz Dolny uh, in a car uh, together with Barbara Kirschenbad, who uh, designed the Pauline Museum, and uh, for eight hours that we were driving, he talked to me and Samuel Gruber. She was telling us what she thought about that museum. I, I wouldn't be able to speak uh, for five minutes what I think about such a museum. However, I think it should be a modern museum a museum which looks into the future, the museum who looks and tries to attract young people who would come and learn something about the everyday life and about the history of religion and the history of the museum and about Holocaust and about the life of Jews and non-Jews in the Soviet Union and in the independent Ukraine. I think it should be a general historical museum with art playing an emotional role that would help people 
to, uh, to uh, dive into that world because art works emotionally on us. Um, it's an aesthetization of what we know. It's a bad taste when the exhibition uh, influences your subconscious or programs you uh, or something like that. The choice should remain uh, conscious and should remain in the visitor's hands. Um, they should be able to critically think about the museum, uh, no matter how famous that museum is. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergei Kravtsov. Thank you. Thank you so much.